Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Available on Apple Podcasts and Podcast One. Welcome into the Sunday edition of the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm Tim Dennison for Dave Schrader, who has the day off. Uh, we've got an exciting program, folks, and uh, we'll be with our guest David Weatherly here in a little bit. We're going to be talking a subject that will absolutely chill you to the bone. At least some people, uh, most people, let's face it, and that's haunted dolls. Uh, we'll be talking about that here in just a moment. I want to remind you about a couple of things first, though, folks. If you're an iPhone user, and we've only been promising this for, oh gosh, I don't know, since 1875 when the, when the show first launched, uh, we have a new iPhone app. It's true. You go to your app store on your iPhone, and, and I've been playing with this thing in the, uh, since it was a beta test, and I absolutely love it. Um, we have a new Darkness Radio iPhone app. Just go to the app store, uh, look for Darkness Radio. And you may say, Tim, why is it under Darkness Radio if the name of the show is Beyond the Darkness? Well, if you're new to the show, that was the original name of the show, Darkness Radio, of course. And if you've ever looked at the full title of the name of the show, it's Darkness Radio Presents Beyond the Darkness. So just go to the app store, look up Darkness Radio. You'll see uh, the little picture of Scully. Download the app. And you don't just get Beyond the Darkness on there. Oh, no, no, folks. You get links to... True Crime Tuesday, you get links to Midnight in the Desert, you get links to The Dark Zone, you get links to all the projects that we're doing, you even get links to darknessradio.com, and so much more. It's all right there on the app. It's amazing. You've got all the all the stuff that we're involved with is all linked up to Darkness Radio's app. It's amazing. It's great stuff. I'm having fun playing with the app. You should, too, if you're an iPhone user. So, again, go to the App Store, download the Darkness Radio app by just searching Darkness Radio in the App Store. It'll come up right there. There's Scully. You just download the app. It's real simple. And there's lots of stuff to look up and play with there on the Darkness Radio app. It'll change your life. Well, I don't know about changing your life, but it's a good thing. So look up that as well. While you're there at the Darkness Radio app, go to darknessradio.com. Oh, by the way, on the Darkness Radio app, you can look at events. And, and while you're there, look up the events tab and see where we're going to be throughout the country. One of the places we're going to be in uh, the next couple of weeks here is Michigan Paracon. We're going to be there. Get your tickets for that. That's coming up here um, in uh, late August. And uh, Dave and I will be there. We'll actually reunite with Mally. It'll be like a full Darkness Radio reunion. Uh, Get your tickets for that coming up in, uh, I think it's October, October, listen to me, August 20th through the 24th, I want to say. Uh, And then... uh, Coming up in October, that's what I meant to say, Chicago Ghost Conference is coming up, and the Jericho Cruise is coming up January 20th through the 24th. Uh, We'll be setting sail on the high seas from Miami to the Bahamas, and a special announcement with that came out this past weekend. Less than 50 cabins are available. It's 96% sold out. You're losing time on this deal, folks. Don't sleep on this. Uh, as Chris has, has added three new attractions on the AEW side, John Moxley has added, uh, Luchasaurus, and uh, I believe Penelope Ford was the other one that was added. He's adding, uh, actually, you know what? Now, this is only the rumor, but uh, on Instagram, if you look at Gabriel Iglesias' Instagram, there's a picture of him and Chris. And he said that he was added to the Jericho Cruise. Now, it's not official. It's not on the JerichoCruise.com site. But if you look at the Instagram, he says he's added. I don't know. I'm not saying anything. There's nothing official out there. I'm just starting rumors and stuff. But if you want to guarantee yourself a a, a cabin and a spot, go to JerichoCruise.com. Get on board. Join your buddies Dave and Tim on the Jericho Cruise coming up in January to go from Miami to the Bahamas for five days. 
it's going to be a great trip. Last time was a blast. It was a vacation of a lifetime. If you want to go on a vacation of a lifetime again, you've got comedy, you've got rock and roll, you've got podcasts, you've got paranormal, and you've got wrestling. It's all perfect. It's a perfect vacation, and it's all on the high seas. It's all in January. Check it out, JerichoCruise.com. All right. With that being said, let's get into the spooky and the paranormal. And uh, I'm not talking about my love life. Uh, Let's talk about uh, haunted dolls. And uh, let's talk with our guest uh, this this evening. Our guest is uh, author and paranormal specialist David Weatherly. And um, the book is Eerie Companions, A History of Haunted Dolls. Let's welcome to the program uh, David Weatherly. Hi, David. How are you? Hey, Tim. How you doing, man? Doing good. Uh, the book is available now at uh, Amazon.com. And is it available elsewhere as well? Uh, Amazon.com is the place to get it. And, of course, unless you catch me in an event or a conference or something, uh, that's the only place at the moment. Now, um, I, I want to get into this right away as far as uh, the history of haunted dolls and, and, and why... The haunting of a doll. Now, dolls are these cute little cuddly things, and and they're they're meant to comfort us. Of course, they're meant to they're meant to bring us comfort as as children, and they're meant to be a companion piece. They're meant to you know be something that that is supposed to be our friend, our buddy. Something that you know it's it's supposed to be a distraction piece, if you will. I guess. Why all of a sudden have we transferred evil and fear into a doll? You know, actually, Tim, that's not that new. And when you really delve into the history of dolls, it becomes quite revealing. Because on one level, of course, uh, they are perceived as the things you say, as as toys for you know primarily little girls, uh, as items of comfort and so forth. But you know, the history and different aspects of the history of dolls are much darker. And honestly, when you when you really go back and look at the origins, uh, there's a big question as to exactly what they were originally created for. Now, the oldest dolls that have been found date to, um, I think the oldest one on record so far is 4,500 years old. So we're talking thousands of years ago, uh, cultures around the world were making dolls. But it appears that the primary reason these items were made often was for ritual purposes. So we get into different aspects of magic and ceremony. Uh, there is there is a history of dolls being created as teaching items. But... When you throw these other things into the mix, it becomes much more revealing. Dolls as toys really only became wide scale and, and prominent, you know, in the early 1900s when industrialization really took over and, and dolls could be mass produced. Uh, but you start delving into the origins and you find some very creepy things. And, you know, even taking out the haunted aspect if you look at things from a different perspective uh for instance and there was a study done in 2013 i believe it was and uh, you guys would love this it was a study on creepiness okay and (laughs) what they discovered was that uh, one of the hobbies that came up near the top of the list as being creepy was collecting dolls (laughs) now you know, why is that? And and as you're saying, you know, why is there such widespread perception now that dolls are, are creepy or scary? Uh, to really examine that, there are a lot of different aspects. We get, of course, the media influence with films over the past several decades, you know, like Chucky and, and Annabelle and things like that. But then we get into some other sort of heavier concepts. And uh, I believe a lot of this goes back to uh, something called the uncanny valley. And this is a a concept that uh, was readdressed by Japanese scientists in the 1970s. Uh, Try not to get too technical or or heavy (laughs) with this on on you guys, but it's pretty fascinating to delve into because 
Uh, this gentleman in the 1970s delved into this concept, and he did so because of uh, his study and the progress being made with robots. Uh, what he delved into was this concept, the uncanny valley, that actually dates back much further. Freud examined it. Uh, there was an earlier paper uh, by a gentleman in the, in the 1900s. And the idea is that when something is created to resemble the human form, it is acceptable to a degree uh, by living humans. When this item, this object, whether it's a robot or a, a doll or whatever it is, when it reaches a certain point that it becomes, quote, too human, it creates a level of, of discomfort and even fear in people. Uh, so what happens is that, uh, and, and a lot of this is from my own study, mm -hmm. what happens is that the, the human mind, the consciousness, uh, sort of wrestles with this uh, figure and exactly how to relate to it when it's not quite human, but it appears human. So, for instance, you know, we have these dolls now that can do so many different things. I mean, they can talk, their eyes move. There are all these things that they can do that make them extremely lifelike. Uh, but it's almost too much for some people to deal with because they can't relate to it as they would a normal human. You know, the body language isn't there. Uh, the the connections not made, you know, when they look into the eyes of this thing as you would make with another living being. So it goes into this very weird territory that's been dubbed the uncanny valley uh, that creates fear in a lot of people. And, you know, the fear of dolls is, is fairly common. Where does David, because it seems like there's a, there's a turning point. You know, you get the dolls that are very realistic, especially when you talk animatronic. And there's a point where fascination turns into fear. The first reaction, it seems like, is fascination. So you get this doll that is lifelike or realistic, especially when you talk about something like, in, in our day and age, it was Teddy Ruxpin. You know, you put the tape in the back and the thing moves and it talks and it sings. And, and, and nowadays, especially with different dolls, they have different functions and they do different things and they are lifelike. And even if you talk about the porcelain dolls um, that have the lifelike eyes or have the lifelike stares, that don't they aren't necessarily animatronic, but look very much realistic. Where does it start that that turning point that goes from fascination to fear, and why, in your opinion, psychologically, does the worm turn from fascination to fear? Well, I, I think it is a a psychological component that's active here. And you know what I'll harken back to almost as, as a descriptor is, I'm sure you remember this, uh, Tim, mm -hmm. Talky Tina. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the famous Twilight Zone episode with Telly Savalas. Mm -hmm. And, of course, for those who haven't seen it, that's a classic, uh, quote, haunted doll story, you know, about this, this child's toy that comes alive and is tormenting this man. So... You know, I, I think the psychological component comes in uh, when, at first, as you said, there's this fascination. It's like, wow, you know, look how lifelike this thing is. You know, its eyes can move, the head moves, it does all these things. But you can't connect with this item the way you can a normal human being. So the psychological component comes in is uh, that comes in is the fear factor. You're wondering subconsciously, what can this thing do? It can't exactly respond to me as a human, but what can it do? It's that fear of the unknown. Again, that's really sort of what the uncanny valley is all about. And, and I believe, you know, this is going to become a much more dominant concept in our culture because we're moving so rapidly into the world of AI. And you see these quote, robots that are being created in, in Japan and other countries that, you know, they are human in appearance and they can respond to questions and, and they can express different things. And, you know, where is that turning point? Where does that become frightening? I, I think it's difficult to answer your question because I believe that it's going to be a different point for different people. You know, uh, you may be much more accepting of 
of lifelike dolls than Dave would be, for instance, but mm-hmm. uh, or maybe less so. So, you know, it all goes back once again to that fear of the unknown. And, and the big question of what exactly is this thing capable of? I, I've seen it moving its eyes, its, its you know, its mouth. It's, it's talking, but what else might it be able to do? And, of course, the question that pops in subconsciously, what if it doesn't like me? Just like talky Tina, you know, I don't like you. <laughs> you know, this may seem like a weird question, uh, David, but does mistrust come as part of a societal mirror? In other words, uh, as society becomes more dark, does mistrust become easier? In, in something like an inanimate object, like a doll. Um, was it easier in easier times to trust something like a doll? Um, like, say, even 100 years ago, was it easier to, to look at a doll and have empathy and not think uh, such dark thoughts about an inanimate object like a doll? I think so. And, you know, that may seem ironic to some degree, but if you look at haunted dolls through history, we really don't have a whole lot of accounts from uh, earlier times of dolls being haunted. There's certainly some stories that are compelling that come in, uh, but they're primarily linked to dolls being used uh, for for ritual or magical purposes. And uh, through that method, creating a little bit of fear, but the fear was more directed towards oh, what has this uh, witch or this magician done with this doll that might harm me? Uh, whereas in, in modern times, you know, uh, the the history of, quote, named haunted dolls is not that old. It, it really goes back, you know, to the grandfather is probably Robert, uh, who's in Key West, Florida. And then, of course, uh, Annabelle's been a, around a long time. Those are the two most recognizable but in recent times, I mean, these things are popping up left and right. And part of that is the dominance of the paranormal within pop culture. You know, everybody's interested and everybody's fascinated. And, and these these haunted dolls are turning up, you know, uh, every, every week it seems like I'm getting, you know, messages about, you know, whoever the haunted doll, you know, this one and that one. And they all have names, of course. Uh, but has, has your stating, you know, society is becoming darker to a degree, and there's such a level of, um, gosh, I'm not sure if there's any singular word, you know, there is a lot of distrust, there's a lot of uh, fear, you know, people really don't know where the state of the world is going, so uh, this, this component comes in out of left field, oh, here we've got all of these things that aren't exactly human but appear human you know what in the world are they going to do to us and uh you know even hearkening back to to things like robots again we've got of course in the back of everybody's mind you know the whole terminator franchise about Mm -hmm. robots who you know look like humans and end up taking over to a degree so uh, we we certainly do have that aspect coming in and there's so much more focus even within the paranormal on things all things demonic and and sinister and man dolls really play into that heavily in many many cases you mentioned uh something that uh fascinates me and i'll 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 ask you about that here in just a second but first folks we've talked a little bit about tv and talked about dolls on television you want to see more of dolls on television and and other things on television. Well, the perfect place to look for it is at Pluto TV and Pluto TV is the leading free streaming television service. You can watch over 100 TV channels and thousands of movies on demand, all completely free. Pluto TV never asks for a credit card. You don't even need to sign up to watch free. Uh, Pluto TV is easy and completely legal way to watch your favorite TV shows and hit movies for free. We want to know, what are you waiting for? Never pay for TV again by downloading Pluto TV. You can download Pluto TV for free on all your favorite devices today, including your phone, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV. I have uh, Pluto TV on all my Apple TVs, smart TVs, PlayStation, and anywhere else you stream. Pluto TV is a leading free streaming television service. Watch over 100 TV channels and thousands of movies on demand 
all for free. No credit card needed, no sign up. Pluto TV is the easy and completely legal way to watch your favorite TV shows and hit movies. What are you waiting for? Never pay for TV again. Pluto, or download Pluto TV for free on all your favorite devices today. Welcome back to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. David Weatherly is our guest, and we are talking about haunted dolls. Uh, and the uh, the new book is called Eerie Companions, A History of Haunted Dolls, and uh, it's available on Amazon.com. David, uh, David, uh, here's the um, one of the points I want to bring up with you, and that is magic and a little bit of trickery. And I think one of the things that got people, even maybe, I would say, 60, 70 years ago, a little bit fooled when it came to dolls and in and I want to go back to the fascination versus um, even being a little freaked out by dolls would be the art of ventriloquism. Um, yeah. and, and the fact that it, it fascinates some people, it freaks some people out. I know there are some people who have a genuine fear of, of sitting and watching someone with a, uh, a ventriloquist dummy or watching... Uh, someone go back and forth, even though there's comedy involved, even though there's there's an, an act to it. I know some people who just are like, no, nah, I, I don't I don't like being around a ventriloquist dummy. I don't like the whole entire deal behind it. The fact that it looks like a little human, the fact that it's this wooden little dummy. And I know that somebody else is voicing it, but there's something about it that just freaks me out. What is it when you were writing this book with ventriloquism that gets people kind of riled up about the whole deal? Well, again, you know, it harkens back to this uh, life that these dolls are given. And, you know, ventriloquism is fascinating because a lot of people don't know this, but it it really has its origins pretty far back in history. We go back to uh, Delphi. And, you know, the, the priests there were known as uh, the Greeks, uh, excuse me, talked about the priests there being gastromancers. And, you know, we get into these concepts that roughly it means uh, belly speaking, or speaking from the belly. Now, they believed that uh, spirits would, you know, speak from the stomach of the mystic and... Uh, this this concept that you know a, a voice from the other side from elsewhere could come through and speak in this manner uh, was was kind of widespread for a time and it was primarily ritual and uh, religious purpose that it was util- utilized for uh, so you know we're talking about a very long period of time it, it was considered a way for the dead to come through and speak through the oracle but in the 1700s the mid 1700s it takes a turn because people started using ventriloquism in a different way they started using it as a way to uh, entertain and it had been suppressed for a time because you know during the medieval period it was connected to black magic and and witchcraft and all all things uh, evil for a time but once it made that transition in the 1700s, uh, it, it rapidly grew into an entertainment art. By the 18th century, uh, we had we had uh, ventriloquists, as we know them today, you know, using these little dolls uh, and making them come to life. So, you know, this takes this takes the interactive doll to a different level because when you see a ventriloquist, you know, a very talented one it's it's pretty impressive because that dummy sitting on their lap or the table next to them, it does take on its own life, its own personality. And, uh, you know, not, not to keep beating the concept, but it goes back again to the Uncanny Valley idea. This, uh, this thing is alive. It's interacting with this man on the stage. Sometimes it's interacting with the audience. And the thought in the back of the mind you know, becomes what is this thing capable of? And, you know, a really good ventriloquist, he, he doesn't look like he's doing anything. You can't see his lips moving. You can't see any 
any movements that indicate that he's the one speaking for the dog. Right. And uh, to some people, that is, that is very disturbing. And of course, again, it's been used very effectively in entertainment. You know, we've got the the film from uh, you know Magic, uh, the film that was one of the one of the big hits that utilized the ventriloquist doll, who kind of takes over and you know controls the ventriloquist to a degree. But then, does he really? Is that just a, a psychological imbalance within the person. I know with a lot of ventriloquist dummies, too, a lot of the classic ones, the eyes are unusually large. And I, I think to a lot of people psychologically, the large eyes tend to tend to be scary. It's almost like... Yeah, it, it, yeah, it can be. It, it's yeah, almost, because it, it's, it's that imbalance again. You right. know, it's like, oh, it looks human, but not exactly. And uh, you know, the eyes, of course, uh, even in early ventriloquist dolls could at least move side to side. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the lids could close. And, you know, you get those those weird mouths that just go up and down. And, and those components, uh, you know, they unsettle a lot of people. Yeah, and, and there were things, uh, there were aspects of the, the dummies that uh, even though some of them looked wooden or very much wooden, they very much came to life or had, like you said, had the aspects that were very much alive. And it was that combination of, of almost dead appearance yet very much alive that, that I think freaked a lot of people out. Um, you, you want something creepy on this topic. I, I'll give you a great sure. story actually, now that we're on ventriloquist all. So yeah. there's one that I cover in the book and uh, <laughs> it's actually owned by a, a good friend of mine. Uh, this ventriloquist doll, is currently known as Mr. Creepy. Okay. Um, Mr. Creepy is um, he's a, a vintage ventriloquist doll. Now, here's the backstory with this thing. My, my buddy, Ross Allison, has a haunted museum in Seattle, Washington. And, you know, like me, he travels a lot, and when he gets a chance, he goes into antique stores and things like that and looks for unusual items. So, uh, Ross was on a trip quite a few years ago and went into an antique store and, and he asked the woman, you know, um, do you have anything you know, unusual or unsettling? Uh, and this woman immediately said, oh, oh yes, you know, Mr. Creepy. And, uh, of course, Ross was intrigued, as I would have been, and, and she took him over to this glass tape and showed him sitting inside this ventriloquist doll. Now, the ventriloquist doll... Uh, she claims would frequently move inside the case. And Ross was intrigued by it. He, he purchased the item and took it back to his museum. Well, here's the thing with this doll. The story is that he was created by a well-known ventriloquist who lived in the Midwest, I believe it was. And uh, this man was uh, an entertainer for years, made his own uh, ventriloquist dolls, and towards the end of his life, he made a ventriloquist doll in his own image. And he used his own hair for the doll. Ooh. So this ventriloquist doll has human hair. Mm. Now, there's, there's another part to the story. Uh, and it, it is this. Uh, the gentleman also made another ventriloquist doll. It was made in the image of his wife and also utilized her hair. The two dolls were together in this antique store for a long time. They had been bought, you know, who knows where, in a state sale or something, has a pair. And when the store went through a process where it moved to a different location, everything was packed and shuffled around and put in storage, and then unpacked, and somehow the two dolls got separated. So the belief and the story is that Mr. Creepy is very unsettled because he's looking for his wife. And there have been incidents uh, that, you know, Ross has caught this thing having moved. It's, it's in a closed glass case, but there have been times when you know, he's come in and the doll is, is turned looking in another direction and 
there have been a few strange photographs caught of Mr. Creepy. You know, one that had a, a very strange reflection that looks, um, <laughs> you know, a, a bit human. Hmm. And all the indications are that this, this doll has a certain amount of residual energy from the ventriloquist who created it. And uh, maybe it's because his hair is on it, or maybe it's just because he put so much energy into the creation of the thing. But again, it appears to be very unsettled because its companion is gone. Well, you would think, though, wouldn't you, David? I mean, after after all the research you've done, after after seeing everything you've seen, I mean, and and that will kind of, I think, springboard into the next topic I want to bring up. But um, you would think after putting your own energy into it and even your own hair into it that you would you would leave in essence and that's actually a good word you would leave your own essence behind in that doll um that essentially you would if it if it wasn't your own spiritual energy you left behind at least your own residual energy behind to haunt oh absolutely doll. yeah absolutely and i think that's one of the ways that dolls become haunted uh, you know simply because so much energy is poured into, you know, what is what starts off as an object. Uh, but, you know, you have to consider something, Tim. We, we really still know fairly little about the human energy field. I mean, we know some things, but from a scientific perspective, it's something that's only been, uh, the surface has just been scratched. So, you know, what exactly happens if, Someone, for instance, grows up with a, a doll and for years uh, treats this doll as a living being. You know, are they are are they creating it as a living being? Like, you know, the the idea of a tulpa, in a sense, or a, more properly, it would be something akin to a golem, in this sense, uh, an object that is instilled with life. Or is it simply because we're pouring so much energy and, and love and affection into it over the years that it does take a portion of our energy, you know, of our essence, and uh, to a degree take on a life of its own? Is it even possible, too, David, that you you put he put so much energy into Mr. Creepy that he was possibly prepping it like a new host body after he died? Well, I don't think he did that consciously, but maybe to a degree, sure, you know, and, and it, it's it's one of those things that it's kind of on a fine line, isn't it? Because, you know, some people hear this story and they're very disturbed by it, and other people hear the story and go, wow, you know, well, he, he loved his wife so much that he wanted something symbolic to, to show that they were staying together even, you know, even after death. Uh, so it's it's difficult for us to say. We don't really have a way to measure or to understand what's in that host, so to speak. But uh, it seems that a lot of in, evidence indicates that there is something uh, within that doll that is making it have some degree of its own life. See, there's a fine line there between love and creepy. I think I don't know. I I, I fall on the <laughs> creepy side on that deal. I to me, it it uh, when you that crosses a line. I think when you when you're taking hair samples and and you oh, start yeah. <laughs> tying that together, I, and then yeah, I keep telling uh, I keep telling Ross he should put an ad in the paper and you know it says Mr. Creepy seats Mrs. Creepy. Uh, but he's, he's concerned he would get the wrong responses, you know. <laughs> um, but you know, the, it's 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 something. You know, they believe that Mrs. Creepy is still somewhere in storage, uh, but it's the other doll has never turned up anywhere yet. And uh, it's you know, it's something that people who know about the doll are always kind of on the lookout for it because it, it will be curious if the companion doll ever shows up to see what happens. That that would be interesting too if you actually got the two dolls within eye shot of each other. If 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 anything did happen, at least energetically. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. That brings me to my my next topic or my next point: voodoo dolls. Uh, something where you actually take and either tie it energetically to a, a, a human 
person or a human soul, or, or you actually take something from that person, tie it to a doll, and then try to cast spell or do spell work with someone. Um, what is it about a voodoo doll that we believe that it has such power over a particular person? Well, this goes back to uh, basically sympathetic magic, the idea that, um, you know, I can take something to represent you and do things to it that I want to happen to you. That, that's in, in the most basic form. That's uh, what we're talking about. So, you know, what better to represent another person than something made in that person's image? And voodoo dolls, you know, have very complicated history. I mean, that could be a whole book in and of itself, because, Mm -hmm. of course, people typically associate them with uh, New Orleans and, and, you know, uh, the sort of, oh, uh, media-created perceptions of of voodoo and so forth. But we really find this concept from different parts of the world. Uh, Probably the earliest Thing that would most closely resemble a voodoo doll actually comes out of Europe, and it's the concept of creating a poppet, uh, which is a human figure usually made of cloth and used for different magical things to influence people. So, you know, in modern terms, uh, these things are, of course, often used to direct negative energy at and attempt to harm. Of course, we have the classic version or visual of a, a voodoo doll with you know pins being stuck in it to create uh, headaches or heart attacks or any range of things. And, you know, this is, uh, this is again, that fear of the unknown because uh, magic, it gets into tricky territory, you know, as, as rational and as scientific as people might try to be. Uh, there's, very often that underlying fear of something that is just beyond understanding, something that might work on a different level. And the concept that, you know, well, maybe there's a, quote, technology that would work to use an item to influence a person. And, uh, you know, there's lots of weird cases and stories out there of people using voodoo dolls uh, for various things and and having success doing so. Uh, Usually the doll is made, as I said, in the image of a person, even if it's fairly crude. And the key component is often that something is added to either represent the person or to make that energetic connection. Uh, So, you know, you hear the old stories and of course, oh, we've got a little bit of this person's hair or some of their nail clippings uh, or something like that. And even in modern times, sometimes they, a photograph is used of the person and, uh, you know, uh, pasted over the face of the doll to fully represent that person who is the target. And the concept, uh, you know, sympathetic magic is really this idea of, again, connecting through the human energy field. So if the energy field extends out enough uh, that you can connect with this other person what other types of influence might you be able to have? What other effects might you be able to create? See, I've seen cases where someone will claim they have a voodoo doll and, and that they've they've actually successfully managed to do something to somebody, even though this person is not a believer in magic, not a believer in voodoo. And other cases where someone has reached out, tried to do something with a voodoo doll to someone, and they're not a believer and nothing's happened. Um, right. And, you know, we get into a lot of questions about that because, of course, uh, some people would scoff at it and say, well, you know, it's, it's BS. You can't do something with a doll. But then you do have these cases that create questions, don't they, where, mm-hmm. wow, this person did this and, and there was an effect. So I think it, it harkens back again to what I was saying about the human energy field. You know, uh, what exactly are we capable of as human beings and and what exactly are we capable of if we are able to utilize our own energy to a greater degree whether it's for the positive or the negative and really that's that's sort of what we're getting into when we talk about these things strange stuff indeed well we're going to take a break here when we come back we're going to talk about uh actual 
haunted baby dolls and, and an actual dolls itself and some of the more famous dolls that are out there and people that want to get into actually trading these dolls and, and picking them up for themselves and wanting to own a doll. Why would you actually want to go out onto sites like eBay and buy these dolls and bring them into your home and uh, have them for yourself? We're, uh, we're talking with David Weatherly and... Uh, his book is out there right now, folks. You can get it on Amazon.com. It's called Eerie Companions, A History of Haunted Dolls. And again, uh, during the break, uh, head out to Amazon.com and pick up a copy for yourself. When we come back, we'll talk more with David Weatherly about haunted dolls. It's coming up next on The Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. Launchpad DM is a totally free platform and service for anyone who wants to podcast, offering unlimited hosting and access to a dashboard with all of your show's analytics. You own and control everything, including subscribers. And it's a great discovery tool to help people find your podcast. You may even get invited to join the official Podcast One roster with even more perks like access to producers, marketers, sales teams, and more. Sign up today at launchpaddm.com. 60 seconds. That's exactly how long this commercial lasts. You want to know what else you can do in about a minute? You can get an offer for your car with TrueCar. That's right. In the amount of time it takes to floss your teeth, pet your dog, or do a few sit-ups, or just listen to my dreamy, creamy, dulcet tones, you can also get a true cash offer. But best of all, you can do it from your smartphone or your home. You just go to TrueCar, simply enter your license plate number, and watch how your car's details pop up. Just answer a few questions and you'll get an accurate true cash offer from a local true car certified dealer. It's that easy. After that, you can bring in your car and they'll check it out with you together. You can ask questions and get all the answers you need so there's no surprises. Then just simply leave with your check or trade in your car for a new ride. So when you're ready to experience a better way to sell or trade in your car, check out true car today. Beyond the darkness. Welcome back to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm Tim Dennison for Dave Schrader. Our guest is David Weatherly, and we are talking haunted dolls. The book is Eerie Companions: A History of Haunted Dolls. It's available right now on amazon.com uh david before the break we were talking about the uh, the current crop of uh, haunted dolls you know we when we talk haunted dolls i guess the image that pops up in people's minds are are the current day crop of of haunted dolls i guess you would think of either a porcelain doll or you would think of um like a baby doll that you would see in in uh in stores or 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 something to that effect or even when you think of uh the classic Annabelle that Lorraine Warren had, uh, you think of the Raggedy Ann doll. Um, but when you were doing research for this book, there's there's actually a chapter on on famous haunted dolls. What what haunted famous haunted dolls did you uh, do the research on, or which ones did you come across? Oh gosh, you know there are so many out there at this point, and um, you know I've. Uh, most of the well-known or, or sort of the, the first tier, I guess you would say, of, of haunted dolls I have seen in person. Uh, so, you know, the as I referenced earlier, the grandfather is, is, you know, hands down Robert, the haunted doll. Now, refresh our memory. Florida. Refresh our memory on Robert, if you would. So, Robert, you know, the story of Robert is... Uh, said to have been the inspiration for Chucky and the Chucky franchise. And this, this story, it goes back to the early 1900s. And uh, I'll I'll give you sort of the short version of the story. What happened was that uh, there was a, a young boy named Robert Eugene Otto who lived in Key West, Florida. And the, the little boy received a doll as a gift. And when he received the doll, he promptly named it Robert. Uh, he gave it his own name. And from that time forward, uh, the little boy became known as Eugene. 
and the doll was called Robert. Now, Robert, for those of you who haven't seen him, I, I encourage you to go on and just, you know, Google pictures of, of Robert the doll. Uh, he's uh, <laughs> interesting looking doll. It, it's um, it, He's in a sailor uniform and just has a very unusual uh, face. And, and um, he, it, you know, he's a one of a kind. Uh, they eventually found out that he came from a display in a window in Germany, I believe it was, uh, and was brought over by Robert's uh, grandfather as a gift. But the story of Robert the doll is that once he was installed in the auto household, strange things started happening. Uh, dishes would break, furniture would get turned over, all these different things would happen. And every time something happened, Eugene would cry out, Robert did it. Blame the doll for all this mischief. Now, people would say, oh, okay, you know, it's a kid acting up and he's trying to blame his doll or whatever. But as the years went on, other strange things happened because people would hear movement coming out of the room that Robert was in when no human was in there. Uh, this, this doll became so well known that uh, eventually uh, they had furniture built for Robert. Oh, and I should back up, actually. What happened was that uh, Eugene, of course, he, he grew up as all of us do. And then when he became an adult, he moved away, got married, but he returned to Key West with his wife and moved back into the auto household and took up his relationship with Robert again. So he gave Robert his own room in the attic of the house, uh, Eugene's wife was, was none too happy with this weird connection that this man had with this doll. Uh, but reports would come that, uh, you know, people would hear something or someone running around in the attic when no one was up there. Uh, Robert would, would sit in a rocking chair, often at the window that looked down on the street. School kids became afraid to walk by the auto household because they said this doll would peer out of the window at them, and they would see it moving. So, you know, more and more legends grew up about Robert and Robert having his own wife. Uh, when Eugene and his wife both eventually passed on, uh, the doll did end up in a museum that took the Fort, uh, East Fort Martello Museum in Key West. And a whole different set of things arose around Robert. There came to be a legend that if you made fun of Robert or if you took his picture without asking permission first, then you would be cursed. Hmm. The museum, Tim, receives dozens and dozens of letters still all the time from people writing to Robert saying, please, lift this curse. I I'm sorry. I made fun of you. I'm sorry. I took your picture without asking. People believe that Robert curses them. And, you know, some of these letters detail a long series of, of misfortunes and strange things that happened immediately after they did something to offend Robert. Really? So, you know, that's the short version of, of the story of Robert. And there's one other kicker, too. Uh, if you see a lot of pictures of Robert now, you'll see that in his, he, he sits in a big glass display case, mm -hmm. and he has a stuffed lion, a little toy lion. Now, the story about that is that one day when the museum opened, uh, Robert always sat in the case by himself, but one day when an attendant came in and opened the museum, they found that one of the other display cases elsewhere in the museum was open. It was a display of, of uh, different toys, stuffed animals, and an item was missing. Well, that item was closed in to the glass case with Robert and it's this little toy lion. So no one could explain it. There was, there was no one in the museum when this happened, and the story has been that Robert decided he wanted a, a companion in the case with him, so... In the middle of the night, he decided to go get one. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the museum staff was so creeped out by it that they just left it how it was. They didn't, <laughs> didn't dare take this thing away from Robert. 
and since then he has stuck with that toy in his case. So it's it's a really fascinating story. Like I said, you know, the, the Robert story dates back to the early 1900s, and this kind of makes him the the one who started the the popular modern wave of of uh, haunted dolls, so to speak. Now, obviously, there's other famous haunted dolls that you mentioned in the book. Uh, what are some of the other haunted dolls that that you've uh, that you've uh, talked about in the book? Well, of course, there's Annabelle. Everybody's uh, fairly familiar with her mm-hmm. now. You know, it was originally a case investigated by Ed and Lorraine Warren, right? And uh, the the movie version gave us the creepy porcelain version of the doll. Uh, but the the real doll is a raggedy Ann mm-hmm. doll. Uh, for anybody who's who's looked into it, even even on a bare level, they'll know that. Uh, but then we have other ones from around the world. There's there's one in uh, British Columbia that I just saw last year called Mandy, the cracked face doll. It's an old porcelain doll that uh, has the name nickname implies has a cracked face. Uh, there's a Harold the Haunted Doll has been fairly controversial. There's Peggy the Haunted Doll who's out here in Las Vegas uh, at Zach's Museum. Now I and do want to ask I do want to ask you about Peggy because I've seen Peggy and I want to talk to you a little bit about the Haunted Museum as well. Um, yeah, sure. Now, now in my experience with Peggy and I have the <laughs> I I tend to be and this is bet- between you and me and a few hundred thousand people who are listening right now. Um, <laughs> I, I tend to be a, a little bit of a paranormal cooler at times. And the night that, that I was at uh, Zach's Haunted Museum, um, I was told by quite a few of the security guards that, man, they are really ramped up tonight. And 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 I'm, I'm sure you can attest to this, David. There there are times when you walk into Zach's Haunted Museum where the energy, in, and at times it's a negative energy, is so palpable you feel like you're swimming or like you're underwater, like it's this wavy oh, sensation. Yeah. And there were mm-hmm. times when I was walking through that that wavy sensation was so strong, and I've only felt it maybe two or three times in my lifetime. Uh, one of the times is at the Gold Goldfield Hotel uh, in Nevada, too. Um, but I was feeling it at different times inside the museum. I went into that room with with Peggy and there's a bunch of us that that went in of course you know you're, you're going with a group um when you when you take the tour um when I went in there with Peggy she didn't say a thing not a word but as I was leaving boy did she talk <laughs> <laughs> she was she was mad I I she didn't say anything to me um but but she I, I don't think she was too happy that I showed up um, I I don't know what that was all about, but um, but you could hear you could hear her screaming as as I after I left the room. Um, wow. I, I'd like to know what now. Obviously, you saw Peggy, correct? You 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 stood in front of her. Oh yeah, I've been in the museum lots of times, and you know it's fascinating to me. I mean, for those who who haven't had a chance to go yet. The museum is incredible. You know, it's, it's quite an experience. Oh, yes. uh, Peggy is in a room by herself mm-hmm. and she is one of the items in the museum that, uh, they essentially give people a choice. You know, the, the guide will do a little spiel outside of the door and say, you know, this is, this is a room with Peggy. You know, you don't have to go in and, and they give a few parameters. I, I won't give those away, mm-hmm. uh, but it's interesting to me, Tim, because, you know, I I don't I don't know how many times I've been in the museum now, but I know that there are the, the greater number of occasions either no one else wants to go in or only a small portion of the group. Right. Uh, so you know the the concept of Peggy, this this doll that can you know cause all this harm or do these things, it really frightens people. And, you know, sort of coming full circle of what we talked about at the beginning, that the fear of dolls is, is pretty widespread. It's one of the more common phobias. Uh, to see it in action like that is interesting because, you know, for me, um, I, I was there on opening day. And, you know, then on uh, the couple of later occasions, there, there was one point where 
you know, uh, it was a it was a large group, and the guy did their spiel, and they said whoever wants to go in can go now. And of course, I stepped up and walked, you know, through the door, and then realized that no one, no one at all had followed me. The <laughs> entire group it was just said no, you know. And I thought this is kind of fascinating because really we're in a situation where all of these people are interested in the paranormal, the, the supernatural, to some degree. So why are even they afraid to go forward and look at this thing? And, you know, it's, it's kind of fascinating on a lot of different levels. It's that fear of dolls again. But then, you know, I think the fear of the unknown uh, once again, because we don't know a whole lot of the history of Peggy. You know, she was uh, the doll that created quite a sensation on the Internet because she was originally owned by a, a woman in the UK named Jane Harris. And uh, Peggy is the doll that purportedly caused uh, misfortunes and even a heart attack by being viewed online on video. Mm-hmm. So there's quite a reputation attached to this doll. But beyond that, we don't know a whole lot really about its history or, or, or anything else. So... It's it's uh, interesting, as I said, that you know so many people who are fascinated by such strange things still won't walk in that room. You know why, David? I I'll tell you this much, and and I'm it's not that I'm I'm shilling for for Zach's museum, um, but honestly, and 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 I'm. I'm a pretty hardcore skeptic. I, I don't, you know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you like it is with a lot of different places that I've been. But from the minute you walk into that place, the energy is very palpable, and it doesn't matter how. I mean, you could be dead as a stone psychic, or or not have very many feelings when it comes to, um, feeling the energy of a room. But when you walk into that place, you feel the energy there. Um, well, and it, it's sort of the perfect storm, though, isn't it? Jim? It because, is, yeah. You know, here here we have a situation where, uh, one, the building was known to have been haunted mm-hmm. you know, prior to this. One of the reasons, obviously, that Zach purchased it. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, you know, he has... He's done a heck of a job of creating an atmosphere in there. I mean, I know he, he invested a lot of time and money getting the atmosphere correct, you know, the way he wanted it. So we do have to consider that as a component. But but then when you look at all the different layers, you know, the fact that the building was haunted, the rumors of, of different uh, ritual things having taken place in the building and so forth, and then, you know, the combination of all of these, I'll, I'll even say purportedly haunted objects. I, I believe a lot of them are indeed haunted. Right. And all of them brought together under a single roof. And, and there are other things in there that even even if you're a skeptic and say, well, okay, I don't believe this thing is haunted, uh, it still goes back to that energetic component because, okay, you might not think it's haunted, but it has a really disturbing history. You right. know, it, it right. has, it's, it's connected to a lot of very unsettling things. Mm-hmm. A case mm-hmm. in point, K- Kevorkian's van yeah. sitting in there, you know, which, which to me, as many times as I've been in that museum, what I find to be the consistently the heaviest energy in that building is the room where that van is. Yes. And, you yep. know, that's, that's just, I mean, it really hits you when you walk in there. If you have any degree of, of, of anything, you know, uh, you call it psychic ability or empathy or whatever you want to call it, it really strikes you when you walk in that room. And, you know, I don't know that I want to give anything away from, uh, because I, it's better for people to experience that room, but I actually think no matter what your, your opinion is of Dr. Kevorkian, I think it's changed once you've been in that room. Um. I think oh, you actually yeah. begin I, to I question his motive as to yeah. why he was doing what he was doing. And 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 the one thing, I'll, and I'll just give you your audio cue here, uh, David, as to why I think so, is that painting that's on the wall, the one where they turn the lights out and you look at it, and it's a it's yeah. a, something totally different. I think that painting yeah. says it all. I think there's yeah. actually um, something very morbid to his his um, his motivation. I'll just put it that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no, I absolutely agree with you. But, uh, 
but you know we we digress quite a bit from dolls but oh, still sure. the the point is is that you know there's so much and of course there is a whole uh range of dolls in the museum you know there's there's one entire uh Ove, I guess you would call it. That's that's filled with haunted dolls. Mm-hmm. There's a room of uh, marionettes, of puppets, yep. and you know uh, there's there are some mannequins even. And really, you know, we go into this whole concept of this phobia. Uh, for a lot of people, it extends to not just dolls, but also into other things that are human-like but don't have a, a life of their own, as we understand it. So you know, people do have a fear of dolls, of ventriloquist dolls, of, of mannequins, you know, because we're into all of these lifelike things that we can't exactly connect with as we would a human or, or a living creature. I was going to say, I, I wanted to bring it back to the conversation with Peggy, and you said that you went in and, and nobody else kind of followed you, and, and you're kind of wondering, you know, you're at the doorstep. And, and I wondered that, too, because uh, there was quite a few of my group that didn't go in, and... I kind of I kind of liken it to this. You go to you go to Disneyland, but you don't want to go see Mickey Mouse. Um, <laughs> right. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, Mickey Mouse is right there, but you don't want to go up and see him or you don't want to go have your photo with him because, you know, but you've come all that way. You've made the trip. You've paid the admission. You've walked through the gates and there's Mickey Mouse, but you won't go say hi. Um, but I I think it's because and, and and follow me on this line of thought here. And it is because. When you've walked into, uh, specifically with, with Zach's museum, you've walked through, you've felt the energy, you've seen, you've, you've, you've felt the palpable energy of everything that, up to that point with Peggy, and then you're being told, well, this doll, Peggy, has caused heart attacks. This doll, Peggy, has actually had a physical effect on somebody. Now, with that, you're, you're being given that knowledge, you've felt this energy, by the way, You're taking a chance if you walk in that room. Do you want to do it? Most people in the interest of self-preservation would say no. But there's those those of us who (laughs) have um, uh, have have done this paranormal thing for quite a while that go, well, you know what? Chances are I'm not going to drop dead of a heart attack. So, yeah, let me in. You know? Yeah, and it's funny, you know, Tim, the, the time, the and, I, and more than once I've been in there and no one else would go in uh, from the tour, but it's funny because the first time I, I really noticed it, of course, I, I walked in, <clears throat> and it's not a huge room, you know, there's a, a fairly small area mm-hmm. for those who haven't been in, but, you know, you walk in and there, there's an area for people to stand, you know, there's sort of a half wall so you can't. They don't want people touching Peggy, obviously. But, of course, I, I walked in, and I moved all the way to the, the end on the side there, thinking that people were going to file in behind me. Right. And, of course, you know, a- after a moment, the door just shuts, and <laughs> there's nobody else in there. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's all right. And uh, the funny thing was, when I when I came back out, they're all sort of standing, you know, a few paces away, I guess, <laughs> watching. And, and they gave me such a strange look, you know, the group did. And, and they sort of, as the tour moved on, people sort of stood away from me a little bit, <laughs> thinking, you know, uh, I don't know if this guy brought anything out of this room or not. <clears throat> but again, it's probably the item in the museum that is, oh, how would we say it, maybe the most, uh, interactive or, or that would cause the most direct connection. I, I mean, I know the other thing that a lot of people are afraid of are the, is the divot spots. Yes, uh, but yeah. then the divot spots, of course, is, is sealed. You know, it's in this, this glass case and it's sort of sitting in the middle of the room and it, it's, it, it really is untouchable. I mean, you can see it, but you're looking at it. There are barriers, you know, that psychological aspect. Oh, it's fine. It's sealed in that case behind, you know, all of these things that keep it protect, you know, keep me protected from it. So I haven't noticed any, I've only seen one or two people not want to go in there because of its reputation. Right. But there's everything else in the museum. There's a certain level of detachment, isn't there? Oh, we can look at this. It's creepy and it's, it's weird and it's disturbing, but you know, there it is. And I'm here. I'm fine. Uh, but Peggy, again, it's that level of, you know, um, 
potentially an entity or a consciousness within that thing that has eyes to look back at you. I, I think that's really what gets a lot of people. The idea that some of these dolls, oh, this is not just a, a doll made of plastic or porcelain or whatever. It's something that is housing a spirit or an entity that's watching me. Right. And that's thinking about me. And and you're communicating and maybe through it's going to do something to me. Right. And you're communicating through a spirit box. So if you hear words and all of a sudden this thing starts talking to you, well, now all of a sudden you've opened up a line of communication and you're potentially talking to a demon. That's right. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah. I think the, the thought of that absolutely terrifies the you know what out of people. <laughs> yeah, but even you know, when when he first uh <clears throat> when he first got Peggy, he didn't have the the, the uh, spirit box running. Right, right. It was just in, you know, the doll was just in the room by itself. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, even then, people wouldn't go in. Right. Yeah, which, which uh, even then, it, before the spirit box, it, it, that, that was even puzzling, that you wouldn't go in and at least look at it. But I understand the dropping dead of a heart attack thing. You know, right. it's yeah. the whole, you know, do I take the chance knowing that someone has you know, has had physical circumstances having, having uh, confronted this doll. Um, exactly. But, but knowing that, you know, there's a difference between um, getting some of the information and having all of the information, you know, you get some of the information if you're, uh, if you've just taken the tour and you know a little bit about the paranormal, if you're, someone who's informed on the paranormal, you know that that those cases are few and far between chances are you can probably go in and see Peggy and nothing's going to happen. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, I mean that, so that, you know, being informed, you could probably go in and, and, and chances are you're not going to walk out of there either a possessed or B with a major medical malady, <laughs> but you do, right. you do <laughs> sign the waiver just in case. <laughs> uh, exactly yeah exactly um so uh, with that being said there are people who want to go out and try and purchase one of these haunted dolls for their own which you know brings up an interesting point here uh david you know when we were when we were doing darkness events uh we would run across some of these haunted dolls in fact um mark and debbie constantino uh, w- would be on our events and we would get a haunted doll and they would do an EVP session with it. And now we would, we would auction it. We were even guilty of it. We would auction off some of these, these dolls for charity. We were raised uh, money for charity and we would say, now mm-hmm. here's the deal. We are auctioning this off to you. It is your responsibility <laughs> once we give this to you. Um, right. But you know, Mark and Debbie have conducted a, a an EVP session uh, for you. Here is the disc of the EVP session uh, with the doll. And, um, you know, congratulations, you've just adopted a bouncing baby um, haunted doll. <laughs> and uh, we had many people who wanted to give it back to us afterwards and said, I listened to the disc, I don't know that I want this doll. Well, you know, but but you donated it to charity and they'd say, oh, I don't care, keep the money. Um, right. Just take the doll back. Uh, what is the mindset? Do you do you figure of why why would people want to go out onto eBay or would want to donate on a, like say a charity auction and want to take one of these things home with them or want to bring it into their home in the first place? Why? Yeah, it's, you know that's that's tough to answer because there's not any one specific answer. I don't think Tim. Uh, you know, we go back again to the fact that. Paranormal has kind of become a hip thing, you know, over the past, oh, I don't know, 10 years or, or maybe more. And with the advent, not of just all the, the reality um, ghost hunting shows and so forth, but then we also had sort of branches off of that, you know, that people get interested in and, and sort of follow, you know, whether it's demonology or whether it's the idea of haunted objects. <clears throat> and hands down, when you look at collectors of haunted objects, uh, you know, you'll find that of uh, the most common haunted object is a doll. Mm-hmm. It goes back uh, once more to that idea that something looks human, so potentially something has taken up resonance in there. 
you know, John Zaff is a buddy of mine. Of course, everybody knows is a haunted collector. You know, he'll he'll tell people, oh, he's got you know he's got a massive warehouse full of haunted items, and hands down, the most common item he has that's haunted is is a doll. So, you know, people. Uh, I think a lot of times people become fascinated by the idea of it, but then dealing with the reality of it is a bit more, uh, a bit more difficult to deal with because, you know, let's be honest, there, there are hundreds, probably thousands of these things out there now, these quote haunted dolls. Uh, you go on eBay and Google it, you'll probably get hundreds of listings. Uh, you find them at, at conferences, on online sites, you know, all over the place. And, some of them, you know, probably are genuinely haunted, uh, but I, I think personally that a large portion of them are, are quite questionable. Uh, people jump into the fray, and you know, it's like anything else. I think there are people who try to take advantage of the interest. So I, I bring all this up because I talked to someone last year, um, maybe it was a year before, but anyway, I talked to someone during the course of writing this book who had previously been a collector of haunted dolls. And she had uh, amassed quite a few haunted dolls, primarily buying them online, and never really had much of anything happen. You know, she had all these dolls, and she would she would try different experiments with the equipment like EMF meters and, and you know, uh, EVP recordings and things like that, and occasionally get a little something here and there. And everything was good, right? You know, she's got all these haunted dolls, and she's sort of, you know, she used to post about it and say, oh, in my haunted doll collection, here's the newest edition, blah, blah, blah. Well, then she bought a doll that was a bit more than she bargained for. Uh, it's, by all accounts, was genuinely haunted. And, uh, you know, it had a, a lot of hype with it, just like a lot of the other ones that she had purchased. But when she bought this doll, when she received it, Tim, she put it up on her, um, she had like a, a dresser or a long counter with all these dolls on it. She put it up sort of uh, front and center, which she would do a lot of times with the newer dolls. And the next morning when she came back into the room where the dolls were, uh, most of the other dolls were on the floor. And this new doll that she had bought was, uh, had repositioned itself. And she just got the idea that it had pushed all the other dolls off the counter. So, you know, things kind of escalated from there and she got very disturbed and ended up getting rid of all of these dolls and just being done with the whole, uh, hobby, so to speak. Hmm. So I think a lot of people, you know, some people want these items that are very um, active and notorious. Some people just like the idea of it. Oh, I've got all these haunted dolls that creep people out, but they don't bother me. Well, they don't bother you because they, for the most part, don't really do anything. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's the, the history is maybe questionable on a lot of them. Uh, but the genuine haunted dolls, that's a whole, it's a whole other world when people start dealing with them. And, you know, having experiences like this woman did, uh, some people would, would enjoy that. Other people would say, nope, I'm done. It's just too much. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of different components. Uh, of course, some people are hoping, I believe, to you know, find the next Annabelle. That can be a big movie franchise. Oh, this is, you know, this is a notorious doll and it scratches people and does all these things. So I think there's always that aspect, too. But then... At the same time, you also have to go through the malevolent haunting that comes with that, you know? Right, but you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, I think people, oh boy, we're getting into some different ter difficult territory here in a way, <clears throat> and maybe this is just my opinion, but I, I think there are a lot of people who don't take that as seriously as they should uh, until they experience it, or, or unless they experience it. So, you know, as investigators or researchers or whatever, we can be objective and step back and we can listen to somebody who's had a traumatic experience, but having one yourself is a whole different world, right? And, you know, a lot of, uh, 
a lot of investigative teams, they, they do a great job of trying to help people. But unfortunately, we have a large subset of teams who, who really, they're just kind of in it for, I don't know, a, a, their own entertainment or because they want to get on television or whatever. And they're not really delving into these cases and, and understanding that, no, this is somebody who's traumatized, who's had a genuine experience. It's not something for you to just come in and, you know, grab a few EVPs and roll out and say, oh, you got demons, we'll see you later. We're probably going off track here some. No, no, no. I mean, do you understand where I'm going right, with that? Right, right, right. Uh, completely. And, and But that always, I mean, that, I guess the star syndrome always baffles me. You know, it, there's... There's very little reward at the end of the rainbow, um, and and I don't think people really realize that. I think people see they see people in in a in a movie, or they see people on television, and they think, boy, that person's really got to be cleaning up. But you got to realize that 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 peak of the mountain is is very tiny, and that there's not really a lot of <laughs> money there, you know. And and yeah. all you got to do is is talk to to anybody at any convention, and they'll tell you that. And they're not they're not snowing you when they tell you that. Yeah. Um, so there, there's not really a lot to be made there. There's, there's not the 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 risk is not worth the reward. Um, so it 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 doesn't uh, and and plus you never know what the and I hate to I hate to sound like the heavy or being I'm being melodramatic here, but the the risk on your soul is not worth it. You know, um, right. I really do believe that. And you may be saying, well, you know, you never know what you're dipping into or whether there is any long lasting effect or anything like that. But you got to believe if you're playing with something otherworldly that there's there's some sort of a risk, even if you get rid of it. You know, well, that, that's true. And it's, you know, the old adage that uh, you stare long enough into the void and, and things begin to stare back. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is very true within the spectrums of the the paranormal and I, I use the term paranormal in a, a very broad sense you know whether you're studying hauntings or cryptids or ufos or the whole gamut uh you know the longer you look at it the more chance that things are going to look back at you and it's uh it, it is something that carries a certain amount of risk at times and you know i think that those who are in this field uh, for the genuine reasons are, are because they're they're passionate about it. You know, it's it's not that they're looking to get rich because they know that you know that uh, those those millions of dollars aren't going to come you know flowing in when you write one book or you get on a television show or whatever. Uh, so you know those those aren't the reasons to pursue the field. And just like anything else, we have a lot of people who are are doing this just because of that. You know, they've seen the whole a lot of paranormal shows and they, they want their 15 minutes of fame or whatever. Uh, but those are, are poor reasons to delve into something like this for sure. Very true. Uh, a quick question here for you, David. Um, I know in your time with talking with John, did he ever state to you why the reason for a spirit to haunt a doll? I know it seems like there's always a malevolent spirit behind a doll, but you know, is it because it's such an easy vessel for for someone to get attached to, for them to, to sucker somebody into? And was there ever a case that you had heard of where a good spirit had haunted a doll? Uh, sure. Uh, well, you know, in, in Zaffis and I have had various conversations about haunted dolls, and, of course, he uh, comes from a, a very, I guess you'd say a more Christian uh, perspective, in a sense, you know, or, or mm -hmm. Catholic, because he trained, of course, at Ed Warren initially. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, he sort of adheres to the concept that a doll, because it looks like a human, you know, can be instilled with something. Uh, my own research indicates that in a lot of cases, that is, that is indeed the case. And if we, if we assume that there are these wandering malevolent spirits that want to take up residence in something, uh, what better form than something that at least resembles a human or a humanoid, uh, you know, in order to to sort of move in to someone's life. And that's one of the ways that a, a doll can be haunted is if something <clears throat> uh, 
something decides to take up residence within the form. You know, of course, the other the other methods are that it may have been used in magic or ritual and instilled with a lot of energy, be that uh, positive or malevolent. Uh, and then the other case that we talked about earlier, the idea that something is, is so loved that it's uh, gains and, and picks up residual energy or, or even a portion of the the original possessor's um, consciousness or their energy field. So those are just three of the basic ways that a doll can be haunted. There are cases on occasion that uh, people have reported a doll that is uh, not malevolent but does seem to have a life of its own and, and it's just, um, you know, probably carrying the essence of the original owner. Hmm. Very interesting. So with that being said, um, if someone does discover that they have just, and it may seem kind of a ridiculous thought to throw out there, that they do have a haunted doll, that they've come across a doll. Let's say they picked one up at a, at a yard sale. They picked up a doll at a yard sale. They, they think it's kind of cute. They pick it up, bring it home. And they've discovered it's it's haunted. How do you uh, how do you suggest they they get rid of it if they want to get rid of it, so that something doesn't hang well, around their home? Right. <clears throat> so usually, oh excuse me. So usually, the best route is going to be to contact someone who deals with haunted items. Uh, I, I'm happy to respond to people. They can contact me through my website. Uh, and then you have people, you know, like John Zaffis and, uh, you know, Zach gets things sent to him at his museum. Uh, really, an item like that, it, it shouldn't just be casually thrown away. It certainly shouldn't be given away to someone else uh, who's unsuspecting. Uh, it shouldn't be, you know, just disposed of because, again, it might be picked up by someone else who doesn't know about the, the strange history. So I advise people to get it to someone who's used to dealing with haunted objects and they'll take care of it okay so it's not something that you just casually put in the goodwill bin and and forget about it (laughs) no i i don't i was i was told by someone uh it's it's really funny that they had a haunted doll and you know purportedly did all these really malicious things and uh you know they're telling me the story and i said well you know if you don't want it in your house, you know, bring it to me. And, and they saw, oh, we already gave that away to the Goodwill. <laughs> like, oh. you know, okay. Oh boy. <laughs> Where's that going to end up? Uh, so who, yeah, who, who knows? Is it, if you fancy yourself a, a, a paranormal expert of sorts, or if you're in a paranormal team or, or uh, I hate to even say this cause it may sound like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of, pardon my language, I'm shitting on people here, but if is it is it not recommended that you try and exercise the doll yourself? Like, <laughs> Yeah, that's not recommended. <laughs> okay. Because I know that... Uh, that could lead to a lot more problems. Because I know that there are some people out there that fancy themselves... Um, how should I put this? Uh quite the the experts that that may think that maybe they could do something on their own like if they if they sage the doll or if they you know if they maybe put some holy water on it or if they figure they they do something or sprinkle salt around it or do whatever they figure they can cleanse the doll themselves and still hold on to the doll is there been cases that you've heard of where that's backfired on someone oh yeah absolutely yeah you know i've I've had people report to me that they had a haunted, haunted doll or other haunted item, and they've tried to, you know, tried to say the Lord's Prayer over it, or they tried to, you know, uh, throw holy water on it or do these different things. And, and uh, oh, yeah, well, it, it seemed to work at first. Well, for, you know, uh, 15 minutes or a couple of hours maybe, and then other weird things start to happen that are even more intense uh, because you can potentially really agitate and, and aggravate something. Uh, if it's taken up residence in that doll, you, you're not going to simply get rid of it by, you know, saying a prayer or doing something very, very simple like that. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's an unfortunate consequence of, of the popularity of the paranormal that we do have all these people who are 
are self dub experts now. You know, I, I can't tell you how many people who are running around now proclaiming themselves either exorcist or, or you know, professional demonologist. Well, what exactly is that? Uh, you know, you start probing into what you're training, you know, where, where does this come from? Uh, you don't get any real valid answers. And, you know, in technical terms, I mean, a lot of different spiritual traditions do have quote, exorcist, uh, as we understand the concept now, it comes primarily from the Catholic Church. So, you know, yeah, you're, you know, if you're, if you're saying the the Lord's prayer and proclaiming yourself an exorcist because you read a book on demonology, you're really, really asking for trouble. And, uh, you know, it's... It's problematic, I think, within the paranormal that we have so many self-dubbed experts now. You know, I, I'm all for people being interested and learning and exploring. I'll tell you something, Tim. I've been doing this stuff since the 70s, and I still have questions. I don't proclaim myself an expert, and I don't say I, I have all the answers. I, I try to learn all the time. Uh, you know, if, you, if you've if you been in the paranormal a couple of years and you think you've got it all figured out, it's probably time to move along to a new hobby and take up, you know, knitting or something. <laughs> um, and I, I'm not trying to sound like a, a you know. No, no, you're, you're dead <laughs> on. You're dead on on that one, that's for sure. I, yeah, so, you, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to get through, <clears throat> I think, what we were talking about earlier, that this field does have potential consequences. It's, it's not something to just play with and, you know, it's, it's something that should be taken seriously. Uh, ha- having Having watched every episode of Ghost Hunters doesn't rate as a qualification in, in my mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when I started doing this stuff, there wasn't any television shows. I, I, I read and read and read in, within the field, and, and then I learned from people directly, you know, who had been in the field for a long time. And I think that's the, the route that more people, I'd like to see more people taking that, that road. Absolutely. That's that's actually uh, the way to go. That that very much is the way to go. Uh, what do you recommend if if somebody wants to advance further in the field? What do you recommend they start out reading? Oh gosh. Well, <clears throat> you know, if they're if they're just interested in uh, the paranormal specifically, of course, you know, you can start with some of the the basics uh, like Hans Holzer. You know, I, ironic that I say that, I guess, because I saw the news that Dave has the, the Holzer Files yep. uh, show, and, and I'm not, that's in no way a, a plug for him, although I don't mind giving one. I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic show, but, you know, Hans Holzer was uh, very active for years. I, I read all of his stuff when I was a kid, and, you know, he was innovative in the uh, and, and very active in getting out there and, and studying and, and, you know, kind of boots on the ground, as you would say, investigating cases. But I would really say that uh, the best approach is to broaden your perspective and learn some basic things about uh, in, investigation, uh, you know, how to how to think in a very open minded, practical approach. Uh, I recommend reading not just books on ghosts, but read things. Uh, two of my big influences when I was young are John Keel and Jacques Vallée. Now, Vallée is a scientist. He wrote primarily about the UFO question, but he does delve some into to folklore and other aspects. And he sort of takes a very rational approach, but also a very questioning approach. And then, of course, Keel, uh, you know, I, I knew John Keel. He was a, um, I know Vallée too, but uh, Keel has passed on now. And he, his approach was more journalistic. You know, he was a reporter. He he got out there, he went to the locations, he talked to people, and you can gain a lot just by reading these guys and sort of seeing through their eyes how they're approaching these things. Mm-hmm. And it's important, I think, to take a very holistic perspective and say, let's look at this from as many angles as possible, because that's the way that we really come up with answers and, and draw some conclusions as to what's going on. Very cool, very cool. Eerie Companions, A History of Haunted Dolls is the name of the book. David Weatherly is the author. It's available right now on Amazon.com. And, of course, um, David, how do people get a hold of you on the Internet? What's your website? EerieLights.com. That is E-E-R-I-E-L-I-G-H-T-S.com. And uh, it's a fairly new website. It's only been up a few months, but lots of stuff on there to explore. Of course, news on all the latest books and other projects, uh, events, Articles, 
videos, all kinds of good things. So check it out, eerielights.com. There's also a contact section on there. If you have some kind of uh, strange experience or question you want to ask me, just shoot me an email through that. Perfect. And we'll look forward to uh, picking up the book, Eerie Companions, A History of Haunted Dolls. Uh, check it out, folks. There's lots of good stuff in there. Again, we only scratched the surface today on Beyond the Darkness as to uh, what's in that book. And there's lots of good stuff in there. So be sure to check it out, Amazon.com, and get a copy today. Dave will be back next weekend. More supernatural news there as well, as well as other great stuff next weekend on Beyond the Darkness. Be sure to pick up the Darkness Radio app if you're an iPhone user. It's in the App Store right now, and it's absolutely free. And be sure to check out darknessradio.com. As David mentioned, the Holzer Files is coming to Travel Channel in October. You can get all the information right now at darknessradio.com, as well as where Dave and I will be around the nation this coming fall and winter. For Dave Schrader, I'm Tim Dennis. This has been the best in paranormal talk radio. You've been listening to Beyond the Darkness. Have a great weekend, everybody.